Let me start by saying that Peter Terry was addicted to heroin. We were friends in college and continued to be after I graduated. (laughs) Notice that I said I. He dropped out after two years of barely cutting it. After I moved out of the dorms and into a small apartment, I didn't see Peter as much. We would talk online every now and then. Uh, There was a period of time when he wasn't online for about mm, five weeks straight. I wasn't worried, though. He was a pretty notorious flake, and, well, a drug addict. So I had just assumed he stopped caring. And then one night, I saw him log on. Before I could initiate a conversation, well, he sent me a message. Oh, man, we need to talk. And that was when he told me about the No Wind House. Apparently it got that name because no one had ever reached the final exit. The rules were pretty simple and... <sighs> cliche. Reach the final end of the building and you win $500. There were nine rooms in all. The house was located outside of the city. Uh, only roughly four miles from my house. Apparently, Peter had tried and failed. I mean, he was a heroin and who knows what the fuck addict, so I figured maybe the drugs had got the best of him and he wigged out at, I don't know, a paper ghost or something. He told me it would be too much for anyone, that it was unnatural. But I didn't believe him. I told him I would check it out the next night. And no matter how hard he tried to convince me otherwise, $500 sounded too good to be true. I had to go, so I set out the following night. When I arrived, I immediately noticed something strange about the building. Have you ever seen or read something that shouldn't be scary, but, I don't know, for some reason, like a chill crawls up your spine? I walked toward the building, and that same feeling of uneasiness only intensified as I opened the front door. The first area was almost laughable. The decor resembled the Halloween aisle at Kmart, complete with sheet ghosts and animatronic zombies that gave a static growl when you passed by. At the far end was an exit. It was the only door besides the one I had entered through. I brushed through the fake spider webs and headed for the second room. I was greeted by fog as I opened the door to room two. The room definitely upped the ante in terms of technological scare factor. Not only was there a fog machine, but a bat hung from the ceiling and flew in a circle. Scary, right? They seemed to have a Halloween soundtrack that one would find in a 99 cent store on loop somewhere in the room. I didn't see a stereo, but I guess they must have used a PA system. I stepped over a few toy rats that wheeled around and walked to the next area. A strange feeling of dread hit me so hard I could barely even think. I did not want to open that door. Logic overtook me after a few terrified moments, and I shook it off and entered the next room. Room three is... Well, that's when things began to change. On the surface, it looked like a normal room. There was a chair in the middle of wood-paneled floor, a single lamp in the corner casting a few shadows across the floor and walls. But that was the problem. Shadows. Plural. With the exception of the chair, there were others. I'd barely walked through the door, and I was already terrified. It was at that moment I knew something wasn't right. I didn't even think as I automatically tried to open the door I came through. It was locked from the other side. 
that really set me off. Was someone locking the doors as I progressed? There was no way. I would have heard them. Was it a mechanical lock that set automatically? I don't know, maybe. But I was too scared to really think. I turned back to the room, and the shadows were gone. The chair's shadow remained. The others were gone. You know, I, I used to hallucinate when I was a kid, so I wrote off the shadows as just a figment of my imagination. I began to feel a little better as I made it to the halfway point of the room. I looked down as I took my steps and that's, well, that's when I saw it. Or, or didn't see it. My shadow wasn't there. I didn't have time to scream. I ran as fast as I could to the other door and flung myself without thinking into the room beyond. The fourth room was possibly the most disturbing. As I closed the door, all lights seemed to be sucked out and put back into the previous room. I stood there surrounded by darkness, not able to move. I'm not afraid of the dark, and never have I been, but I was absolutely terrified. All sight had left me. I held my hand in front of my face, and if I didn't know what I was doing, I would have never been able to tell. The darkness doesn't describe it. I couldn't hear anything. It was dead silence. When you're in a soundproof room, you can still hear yourself breathing. You can still hear yourself being alive. I began to stumble forward after a few moments, my rapidly beating heart the only thing I could feel. There was no door in sight. I wasn't even sure there was one this time. The silence was then broken by a low hum. I felt something behind me. I spun around wildly, but could barely even see my nose. I knew it was there, though. Regardless of how dark it was, I knew something was there. The hum grew louder, closer. It seemed to surround me, but I knew whatever was causing the noise was in front of me, inching closer. I took a step back. I had never felt that type of fear. I can't really describe true fear. I wasn't even scared I was going to die. I was scared what the alternative was. I was afraid what this thing had in store for me. And then the lights flashed for a second and I saw it. Nothing. I saw nothing. And I know I saw nothing there. The room again plunged into darkness, and the hum became a wild screech, and I screamed in protest. I couldn't hear this goddamn sound for another minute, so I ran. I ran backwards, away from the noise, and I fumbled. I fumbled for the door handle, and I turned, and I fell into room five. Before I describe room five, you have to understand something. I am not a drug addict. I have no history of drug abuse or any sort of psychosis, short of the childhood hallucinations I had mentioned earlier. 
and those were only when I was really, really exhausted or just waking up. After falling in from the previous room, my view of room 5 was from my back looking up at the ceiling. Now what I saw didn't scare me, it simply surprised me. The ceilings were taller than the others, which made me think I was in the center of the house. I picked myself up off the floor, dusted myself off, and took a long look around. I couldn't even see the door from where I was. Up until this point, I figured the rooms were going to get scarier. I also assumed whatever in room four remained behind me, but oh, I was incredibly wrong. As I made my way deeper into the room, I began to hear what one would hear if they were in a forest. Chirping bugs and the occasional flaps of birds seemed to be my only company in this room. That was the thing that bothered me the most. I didn't see any of them. I began to wonder how big this house was. From the outside, when I had first walked up, it looked like a regular house. It was definitely on the bigger side, but this was almost a full forest in here. The canopy covered my view of the ceiling. I couldn't see any walls either. I kept walking, hoping that the next tree I passed would reveal the door. And after a few moments of walking, I felt a mosquito fly into my arm. I shook it off and kept going, but a second later, I felt about ten more land on my skin at different places. I felt them crawl up and down my arms and legs, and a few made their way across my face. I flailed wildly to get them off of me, but they just kept crawling. I didn't see a single bug. Not one bug was on me, but I could feel them crawl. I heard them fly by my face and sting my skin, but I couldn't see a single one. I dropped to the ground and began to roll. I hated bugs, especially ones I couldn't see or touch, but these bugs could touch me, and they were everywhere. I had no idea where I was going, where was I rolling, where was I crawling. The entrance was nowhere in sight, so I just crawled, my skin wriggling with the presence of those phantom bugs. And after what seemed like hours, I finally found the door. I grabbed the nearest tree and propped myself up mindlessly slapping my arms and legs to no avail. I tried to run, but I couldn't. My body was exhausted from crawling and dealing with whatever it was that was on me that I could not see. I took a few shaky, uncertain steps to the door, grabbing each tree on the way for support. It was only a few feet away when I heard it. The low hum from before? It was coming from the next room, and it was deeper. I could feel it, almost feel it inside of my body. Like when you stand next to an amp at a concert in the front row. The feeling of the bugs on me lessened as the hum grew louder. As I placed my hand on the doorknob, the bugs were completely gone, but I couldn't bring myself to turn the handle. I knew that if I let go, the bugs would return, and there was no 
way I would make it back to room four. So I just stood there, my head pressed against the door, marked six, and my hand shakily grasping that knob. The home was so loud, I couldn't even hear myself pretend to think. There was nothing I could do but move on. Room six was next, and room six was hell. I closed the door behind me, my eyes held shut and my ears ringing. The door clicked into place. The hum evaporated. I opened my eyes in surprise and the door I had shut was gone. It was just a wall now, and I looked around in shock. The room was identical to room three. The same chair and lamp, but with the correct amount of shadows this time. The only real difference was that there was no exit door, and the one I had come through was gone. Now, as I said before, I had no previous issues in terms of mental instability, but at that moment, I fell into what I know now was complete insanity. I didn't scream. I didn't even make a sound. At first, I scratched softly. The wall was tough, but I knew the door was there somewhere. I just knew it was. I clawed at the wall frantically with both hands, my nails being filed down to the skin against the wood. The only sound in the room, the incessant scratching against the wall. I knew it was there. The door was there. I knew it was there. If I could just get past this wall. Can you see me? I jumped off the ground and spun in one motion. I leaned against the wall behind me and I saw what it was that spoke to me and to this day I regret ever ever turning around there was a little girl she was wearing a soft white dress that went down to her ankles she had long Blonde hair and brilliant, intoxicating blue eyes. She was the most frightening thing that I had ever, ever seen. And I know that nothing in my life will ever be as unnerving as what I saw in her. While looking at her, I saw something else. Where she stood, I saw a man's body, only larger than normal and covered in hair. The form had the head of a ram and the snout of a wolf. It was horrifying, and it was synonymous with the little girl in front of me, but I saw them at the same time, and they shared the same spot in that room, but it was like looking at two separate dimensions. When I saw the girl, I saw the form, and when I saw the Form, I saw the girl, and I couldn't speak. I could barely even see. I had been scared before in my life, but I had never been more scared than when I was trapped in the fourth 
room. But that was before room six. I just stood there staring at whatever it was that spoke to me. There was no exit. I was trapped here with it. And then it spoke again. Can you see me? When it spoke, I heard the words of the little girl, but the other forms spoke through my mind in a voice I will not attempt to describe. There was no other sound. The voice just kept repeating that sentence over and over in my mind until I agreed I was slipping into madness. Yet I couldn't take my eyes off of what was in front of me. I dropped to the floor. I, I thought I had passed out, but the room wouldn't let me. I just... I wanted it to end. I just wanted it to end. But then I was on my side, my eyes wide open, and the form staring down at me, scurrying across the floor in front of me was was one of the battery-powered rats from the second room. The house was toying with me. But for some reason, seeing that rat pulled my mind back from whatever depths it was headed. I was determined to get out of that house and live. I knew this room was hell, and I wasn't ready to take up residency. I searched the walls for any kind of opening. The room wasn't that big, so it didn't take long to soak up the entire layout. The demon still taunted me, the voice growing louder as the form stayed rooted where it stood. I placed my hand on the floor, lifted myself up to all fours, and turned to scan the wall behind me. And then I saw something that I couldn't believe. The form was now right at my back whispering into my mind, telling me I never should have come here. I felt its breath on the back of my neck, but I refused to turn around. I couldn't turn around. A large rectangle was scratched into the wood with a small dent chipped away in the center of it. Right in front of my eyes, I saw the large seven that I had mindlessly etched into the wall. I knew what it was. I knew what it was. Room seven was just beyond that wall, where room five was just moments ago. I don't know how I had done it. Maybe it was just my state of mind at the time, but I had created the door. I knew I had. In my madness, I had scratched into the wall what I needed the most. An exit to the next room. Room seven was close. And I knew that the demon was right behind me. But for some reason, it couldn't touch me. So I closed my eyes, and I placed both hands on the large seven in front of me. I pushed. I pushed as hard as I could. The demon was now screaming in my ear. It told me I was never leaving. It told me that this was the end and I was going to die. But I wasn't going to die. I was going to live there in room six with it forever. But I wasn't. 
I wasn't. I couldn't. So I pushed and I pushed. I clenched my eyes shut and I screamed at the top of my lungs. And the demon was gone. And I was left in silence. I turned around slowly and was greeted by the room as it was when I entered. Just a chair. Just a lamp. I couldn't believe it, but I didn't have time to dwell. I turned back to the seven and then jumped back slightly. What I saw was a tour. It wasn't the one I had scratched in, but a regular door with a large seven on it. My whole body was shaking, and it took me a while just to turn the knob. I stood there, staring at the door, but knowing I couldn't stay in room six. I couldn't. But if this was only room six, I could not imagine what room seven had in store. I must have stood there for an hour, just staring at the seven. And then finally, I stumbled through the door mentally exhausted and physically weak. The door behind me closed and I realized where I was. I was outside. Not outside like in room five, but actually outside. My eyes stung and I wanted to cry. I fell to my knees and tried, but I couldn't. I was finally out of that hell. I didn't even care about the prize that was promised. I turned and saw that door I just went through was the entrance. I walked to my car and drove home thinking how nice a shower sounded. As I pulled up to my house, I, I felt uneasy. The joy of leaving no end house had faded and dread was slowly again building in my stomach. I shook it off as residual from the house and made my way to the front door. I entered and immediately ran up the stairs to my room. There on my bed, thankfully, my cat Baskerville. He was the first living thing I had seen all night and I reached out to pet him lovingly. But he hissed and swiped at my hand like he had never done before. I recoiled in shock, but I thought, whatever, he's just an old cat. I jumped in the shower and I got ready for what I was expecting to be a very sleepless night. After my shower, I went into the kitchen to make something to eat. I descended the stairs and turned into the family room, but what I saw would be forever burned into my mind. My parents were lying on the ground naked, covered in blood. They were mutilated to near unidentifiable states. Their limbs had been removed and placed next to their bodies, and their heads were placed on their chests facing me. The most unsettling part, though, was their expressions. They were smiling as though they were happy to see me. I vomited and sobbed there in the family room. I didn't know what had happened. They didn't even live with me at the time. Why were they here? I was a mess. I was a wreck. I was a complete sobbing mess. And then I saw it. I saw it. 
a door that was never there before. A door with a large eight scrawled in blood. I was still in the house. I was standing in my family room, but I was in room seven. The faces of my parents smiled wider as I realized this, like they knew. But they weren't my parents. They couldn't be. But they looked exactly like them. The door marked eight was across the room behind the mutilated bodies in front of me. I knew I had to move on. But at that moment, I had given up. The smiling faces of my mother and father tore into my mind and grounded me where I stood. I vomited again and nearly collapsed. Then the hum returned and it was louder than ever and it filled the house and shook the walls but the hum compelled me to walk. So I walked slowly making my way closer to the door and the bodies and I could barely stand let alone walk and the closer I got to my parents the closer I came to suicide. The walls were now shaking so hard it seemed as though they were going to crumble around me. But still, my parents' faces smiled at me. As I inched closer, their hollow eyes followed me. I was now between the two bodies, just a few feet away from the door. The dismembered hands clawed their way across the carpet toward me. All the while, their faces continued to stare. New terror washed over me as I walked faster, ran faster. I could hear them mumbling, speaking to me, calling my name, and I did not want to hear them speak. I did not want the voices to match those of my parents, but they did. They began to open their mouths, and the hands that were inches from my feet grasped my ankles as they screamed at me. And in a dash of desperation, I lunged for the door, threw it open, and slammed it right behind me, right into room eight. I was done. I was done. After what I had just experienced, I knew there wasn't anything else this fucking house could throw at me that I couldn't live through. But unfortunately, I underestimated the abilities of the no in the house. Things got more disturbing, more terrifying, and more unspeakable in room eight. I still have trouble believing what I saw. Again, the room was a carbon copy of rooms three and six. But sitting in the unusually empty chair was a person. After a few seconds of disbelief, my mind finally accepted the fact that the person sitting in the chair was me. Not someone who looked like me. It was me. 
I walked closer. I had to get a better look, even though I was sure of it. And they looked up at me, and I noticed tears in their eyes. And they pleaded. Please, please don't do it. Please don't hurt me. And naively I asked, what? Who are you? Who are you? I'm not going to hurt you. Yes, you are. They sobbed. You're going to hurt me and I don't want to hurt you. They sat in that chair with their legs up to their chest and began rocking back and forth. And it was so pathetic looking that it made me angry. Especially since it was me. Identical in every way. So I said, Who are you? And I was now only a few feet from my disgusting doppelganger. And it was the strangest, weirdest experience. Standing there, talking to myself. And I wasn't scared. But I would be soon. Why are you... Why are you saying this? Just calm down, okay? Just calm down. Let's try to figure this. And then I saw it. I saw myself sitting down. And I was wearing the same clothes as me, except for a small red patch on their shirt. Embroidered with the number nine. You're going to hurt me. You're going to hurt me, please. You're going to hurt me. You're going to hurt me. My eyes didn't leave that small number on their chest. Because I knew exactly what it was. The first few doors had been plain and simple. But after a while, they had gotten a little more ambiguous. Seven was scratched into the wall, but by my own hands. Eight was marked in blood above the bodies of my parents. But nine... Nine was on a person. A living person. It was on a person that looked exactly like me. They were me, right down to the voice, but they were nine. I paced around for a few minutes while they sobbed in their chair. The room had no door, similarly to room six. The door I had come through was gone. For some reason, I assumed that scratching would get me nowhere this time. So I studied the walls and floor around the chair, sticking my head underneath and seeing if there was anything below. Unfortunately, there was. Below the chair was a knife, and attached was a tag that read, To you, from management. The feeling in my stomach as I read the tag was something sinister. (laughs) I wanted to throw up, and the last thing I wanted to do was remove that knife from under the chair. The other me was still sobbing uncontrollably, and my mind was spinning into the attic of unanswerable questions. Who put this here? How did they get my name? Not to mention the fact as I knelt on the cold wood floor, I also sat in that chair. It was all too much to process. The house 
the management had been playing with me this whole time. My thoughts for some reason turned to Peter and whether or not he had got this far. If he did, if he met a Peter Terry sobbing in this very chair, rocking back and forth, (laughs) I just shook those thoughts out of my head. They didn't matter. And I took the knife from under the chair and immediately the other me, the other me went quiet. What do you think you're going to do? They said in my voice. I wiped the tears from my swollen face and I lifted myself from the ground and I clenched the knife in my hand. And I said, I'm going to get out of here. The other me was still sitting in the chair, though they were very, very calm now. They looked up at me with a slight grin, and I couldn't tell if they were going to laugh or strangle me. Slowly, They got up from the chair and stood facing me head on. It was uncanny. Their height and even the way they stood matched mine and I felt the rubber hilt of the knife in my hand and I gripped it tighter. I don't know what I was planning on doing with it, but I had a feeling that I was going to need it. I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to hurt you, and I'm going to keep you here. Their voice was slightly deeper than mine. I didn't respond. I just lunged and tackled them to the ground. I mounted them and looked down, knife poised and ready. They looked up at me, terrified. It was like looking into a mirror. And then the home returned, low and distant though I still felt it deep in my body. My doppelganger looked up at me as I looked down at it, the hum ever louder, and I felt something inside of me snap. With one motion, I slammed the knife into the patch on their chest and ripped down. Blackness fell on the room, and suddenly I was falling. The darkness around me was like nothing I had experienced up to that point. Room 4 was dark, but it didn't come close to what was completely engulfing me now. I wasn't even sure if I was actually falling after a while. I felt weightless, covered in dark. Then a deep sadness came over me. I felt lost, depressed, suicidal. The sight of my parents entered my mind, but I knew it wasn't real. I had seen it, but it wasn't real. The sadness only deepened. I was in room nine for what seemed like days. The final room. And that's exactly what it was. The end. No end house had an end, and I had reached it. At that moment, I gave up. I knew I would be in that in-between state forever, accompanied by nothing but darkness. Not even the hum was there to keep me sane. I had lost all senses. I couldn't feel myself. I couldn't hear anything. Sight was completely useless here. I searched for even a hint of taste in my mouth and found nothing. I felt disembodied and completely lost. I knew where I was. I knew where I was. This was hell. Room 
nine was hell. Then it happened. A light. One of those stereotypical lights at the end of the tunnel. And I felt ground come up from below me and I was standing. And after a moment or two of gathering my thoughts and senses, I slowly walked toward that light. And as I approached that light, it took form. It was a vertical slit down the side of an unmarked door. And I slowly walked through the door and found myself right back where I started. The lobby of No End House. It was exactly how I had left it. Still empty. Still decorated with childish Halloween decorations. After everything that had happened that night, I was still wary. I looked around the place, trying to find anything that was different. On the desk in front of me was a plain white envelope with my name handwritten across the front. Immensely curious, yet still cautious, I mustered the courage to open it. Inside was a crudely handwritten letter. Congratulations, you have made it to the end of No End House. Please accept this prize as a token of great achievement. Yours forever, management. And with that letter were five crisp $100 bills. I couldn't stop laughing. I laughed for what seemed like hours. And then I laughed even more. I laughed as I walked out to my car, and I laughed as I sat inside and started the engine, and I laughed, deliriously laughed, as I drove all the way home. And I laughed as I pulled into my driveway, and I laughed when I opened the front door to my house and I laughed when I saw the small number 10 etched into the wood. <laughs>